now in 2021, uh, Scotland is a, a sad and uh, angry uh, and and frightened place with you know with lots of people full of dismay and, and, and apprehension about what the future must hold. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. And a fascinating guest we have for you today. He's returning to the show for the second time. Scottish historian, TV presenter, Neil Oliver. Welcome back to Trigonometry. Oh, uh, thank you very much for having me, gents. It's good to see you both. It's good to see you and to have you back. Listen, since we last spoke, we talked mainly about history and uh, the pandemic and things like that. But uh, there's been a lot going on in your country, in Scotland. I lived there for many years and I have no idea what's going on. And we were just looking at it going, we need someone to explain it to us. And here you are. Oh, my goodness. Well, in the beginning, the earth cooled. <laughs> and part of it for me i would say right right from the top you know you, you say my country of scotland and and of course i was born and i live in scotland but um the whole thing for me is is underwritten by the fact that my country is britain mm. um that is and that's not a or it never used to be a political statement uh i was born well 54 years ago uh and just quietly without any particular reason by osmosis or whatever uh, absorbed an understanding that I was British born in Britain uh, and it's it's very important to me that that, that situation prevails um, uh, the, the, ap apart from anything else I'm often characterized uh, as being anti-Scottish independence in truth I'm not actually anti anything F first and foremost I am just for the United Kingdom of Britain, because that's where I was born, and that nationality is my is part of my identity, and I, I simply refuse to have any group of politicians here today, gone tomorrow, strip me of what I understand to be my nationality, and replace it with another, uh, without my consent, uh, and so, yes, there's there's a great deal happening up here uh, on account of the. The, the Scottish government at the, uh, in the Scottish Parliament at uh, at, at Holyrood, uh, and I am I am confused and dismayed by by a lot of it. But but my stance is and always has been that I am I am for Britain. That's that's mm. that being British is what I understand about myself. Touche, Neil. Uh, what we like to do here at Trigonometry is start the interview by asking a slightly insensitive question uh, to, to get the guests nice and warmed up. And so we've managed to do that. But uh, it seems like uh, you guys are having some sort of like live action Macbeth reenactment in Scotland. Uh, so can you tell us more about what's happening there? I, I suspect you're probably referring to the, um, the, the what is generally known as the Alex Salmond inquiry, mm. uh, which has, yes, it's been... Uh, it's been a Shakespearean uh, drama uh, played out across what feels like years, um, and it has well, you know, it has it has run its course in terms of the Salmond inquiry has run its course, uh, and but having said that, it, it remains it remains unclear exactly what it decided. Uh, the 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 inquiry's own committee seemed to decide that uh, the first minister had misled. Parliament, uh, but then there's another another judgment came in from a from an from an independent uh, uh, in another independent inquiry that that said differently. So th exactly what has been decided at the end of the the months years of wranglings around what Alex Salmond was first of all alleged to have done, then his name was cleared in court, and then this whole inquiry into the way in which he was investigated by government has run on and on and on. It has taken on layers of Byzantine complexity. Uh, I think anyone outside of Scotland would struggle, would struggle to have followed the twists and turns of it. You know, you'd really, you'd really have to be an obsessive. You'd really have to be invested in the whole... Uh, the whole imbroglio to, to keep up with it, um, and I, I don't I don't claim to have followed every twist and turn. What what I take away from it though is the extent to which the, the this Scottish government uh, has uh, has chosen secrecy over openness, 
there has just been from the beginning there was there were efforts made and, and, and a concerted attempt to keep as much as possible under wraps and and this from a, a government that had said all along or said in the past that it was always going to be open always going to be open with the people of Scotland that it had nothing to hide that everything would be there to be looked at and discussed uh, the first minister said exactly that that she intended to uh, uh, um, cooperate with the inquiry completely and fully and that nothing would be off limits and yet it has just been a culture of secrecy and obfuscation and uh, you know hiding behind legalities uh, legal minutiae uh, and there has just been this constant attempt to keep as much information it would appear as possible away from the the general public certainly from the Scottish public that's what I have taken away from it and that is what dismays me uh, that we live, that we're living with a, a government that is so secretive about how it goes about its business. And Neil, do you think that this has irreparably damaged Sturgeon's uh, premiership? Oh gosh, uh, no. Uh, I, I think the, I think she is in. Um, what she continues to be, I would say, in a in a, a fairly unassailable position. Uh, the, the Scottish National Party is is so strong, uh, has taken such uh, control over so much in Scotland. The Crown Office, which is the which is the Scottish equivalent of the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, you know, has been working in concert with the Scottish government. Uh, therefore, you cannot say with any confidence. In fact, you can't say at all that that there's separation of powers in Scotland. You know, the whole one of the principles of Western liberal democracy and governments thereof is that the legislative and the executor and the judiciary are separate from one another. That's not the case in Scotland. There's no second chamber in the Scottish Parliament, no House of Lords or, or its equivalent. Uh, and the, the, the doings, the business of government is supposed to be scrutinised by committees. And it was said long ago... Uh, when those when the when the devolution settlement was was put in place that the that the the committees would have all the teeth they needed uh, properly and effectively to hold uh, the government to account but the Salmond inquiry uh, has absolutely laid bare the fact that the Scottish parliament cannot hold the Scottish government to account uh, as far as it would appear the the Scotland act and the devolution settlement, uh, w which was the product of, of the Scotland Act, is not fit for purpose, uh, and it's. I, I find it. I find it harrowing. I, I. I feel that we live in something that's nudging towards a, a failed state, a, a, a banana republic where bananas don't grow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll wait for global warming now. Then we'll see bananas in Scotland. Uh, but but Neil. He, you make it sound as if Scotland is in some kind of political crisis, which from the outside, no one would have, you know, it, it seems that, you know, Sturgeon has had a very good war in terms of the, you know, the coronavirus. Is it really that bad up there? Uh, well, it depends what side of the line you're standing on. I, I, I'm sure um, those who support the Scottish government and those who support the Scottish National Party will be, you know, will be, will be very happy with what has happened. But... Scotland is absolutely a country that's split down the middle. Uh, 14 years of the Scottish National Party has seen to that. Scotland is a divided place. Uh, the Scotland that I grew up in, well, it's it's unrecognisable now. Uh, the atmosphere is one of bitterness, constant anger, uh, division, uh, clannishness, uh, uh, feelings of being on, you know, of two fundamentally two tribes, you know, being on the barricades, hurling uh, whatever ammunition they can at one another. Uh, and there's a feeling that that situation just becomes ever more, ever more entrenched. You know, you say that Scotland had a good, uh, or the Scottish government had a good COVID. Well, they didn't. The, the, the deaths, such as they're being tallied, are obviously everything's on a smaller scale. In Scotland, we've only got 5 million of a population compared to, you know, 60 odd million in England or in the rest of the UK so the numbers are always smaller but examined proportionally uh, our death tolls have been the same the situation in the care homes was desperate uh, more people died proportionally in the care homes in Scotland than did so in the rest of the UK uh, and when I last looked at the figures and I, I don't look at them on a daily basis but we seemed to be uh, you know one of the worst places uh, in the UK or the worst place in the UK in terms of covid uh, infections or cases or however they're however they're counting it and and, uh, and categorizing it today or this or this morning 
And so we haven't had a good COVID. We've had the same COVID as everybody else uh, in the UK. We've, because of devolution, uh, the First Minister here, Nicola Sturgeon, has been able to plough her own furrow up to, an ex- up, to a, up to a point or to an extent. And so uh, there have been different dates about when we would open this or close that. And, you know, if you were allowed six people, we might be allowed eight. Or, you know, there's been variations almost just for the sake of variation. But uh, as, a, as a place to be, as a place to live, now in 2021, uh, Scotland is a, a sad and uh, angry uh, and and frightened place with you know with lots of people full of dismay and and, and apprehension about what the future must hold. That broadcast was brought to you by the Scottish Tourist Information Board there, Neil. Well done. Uh, but uh, I, it's obviously a difficult time. Uh, and you feel very strongly about the independence issue. And I actually wanted to ask you, is there anything beyond independence itself that underpins that divide? Uh, is, it, is there a religious or ethnic or sort of political? Like, what is the divide about? Or is it purely about... Do you want Scotland to be independent of the United Kingdom? That is the that's the fracture. That's the fault line, I suppose, a, a, along which the country has most obviously split. Uh, you know, S- Scotland, like anywhere, I mean, it's not unique to to Scotland, but it's a place of many tribes, if you like. Uh, you know, t- it's it's difficult to talk of one Scotland. Uh, historically, it was a place of of clans, a place of tribes, you know, going back further beyond, before the time of, of the clans. Uh, and uh, as you travel through what is a relatively small place, there's a great variety in the population of Scotland. The north is very different from the south. The east is very different from the west. Yes, there has, of course, courtesy of sectarianism between Catholic and Protestant, there's, there's always been a religious element to to certain unhappinesses in, in Scotland. Uh, but, you know, the, the people of, of Orkney and Shetland, for example, have always walked a different road than the rest of Scotland. The people of the borders are very different from the people in the northeast or in the northwest. The, the islands out to the west, the Western Isles, it's a different culture, a different a different group out there. It's, you know, there's always been a, a, a kind of a, a, a Gallic uh, a, a Gallic dominance out in the Western Isles or, or, or into the west. There's been always been pockets of Gallic culture. So Scotland is an enormously varied place, uh, which makes it very difficult when you start talking about one Scotland. At the last referendum in 2014, uh, the, the result was 45-55, 55% of those voting, favouring, remaining in the United Kingdom. But it's definitely worth pointing out that of 32 local authorities in Scotland, 28 opted for remaining part of the United Kingdom. And only four, only four local authorities out of 32 uh, had a majority in favour of of leaving the union. And that's very significant. You know, the the heartland of of the independence vote has always been Glasgow, Eastern Barton, uh, uh, Dundee. You know, that's always been the, that's always been where the hard core of of independence has been. Down in the southwest of Scotland, over in the borders, the northeast, the northwest, not so. uh, So it's a very... um, it's a, but that's that, that those kind of those kind of local divisions, differences in, in local communities. They're always there. They're in every country. It's the same in England, same in Wales, same in Ireland. There's there's great differences, but the fundamental fracture across which that has broken Scotland's back is the issue of uh, independence. And that, uh, there's a terrible sense of uh, hopelessness about it, really. But I believe that the, that that split is is and always was uh, roughly fifty fifty. Depending on what day of the week or what year you wanted to take a a, a referendum, hold a referendum, or take a straw poll, it, it would drift slightly either way. But it's more or less half and half. Half the country in favour of one, half the country in the favour of the other. Which means that whatever happens, if there was a referendum tomorrow that came down in slightly in favour of independence, you've still got half the country unhappy, and that's very difficult uh, for. That's the, 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 that's a very difficult um, foundation upon which to build anything cohesive. I've always said it's a bit like if you if you're trying to fly a light aircraft, you know, a wee Cessna or something, and you've got a dead elephant strapped to one wing. <laughs> it's going to be really difficult to fly the thing because it's so uh, unbalanced. And, and so, if there if there is a subsequent referendum, or if there are more referenda, 
in the years ahead, I think it will always split roughly 50-50. So it's, it's always going to be a Pyrrhic victory for whoever carries the day. And I said right back in, well, before the 2014 referendum, it's probably a question better left unasked because the answer's just going to make everyone unhappy. And so it has done. Neil, as an Englishman, I don't understand what you're talking about with referendums making people unhappy or splitting the country. <laughs> We've got, I've got no idea what you're talking about. But it's very, it's very interesting, the points you make. One of the points that I wanted to make is how much of the sort of anti-union feeling has been exacerbated, number one, by Brexit, and number two, by, what, 12 years now or, or 11 years now of Conservative rule? Would it be more palatable to remain within the union if, number one, we were still in the European Union, and number two, if we had a Labour Party in charge? That's You've just added another layer of complexity and incomprehensibility to the whole thing there. <laughs> it's what I bring to the podcast now. <laughs> because, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why, in, in 2014, or in the run-up to that, that first that referendum on, uh, on on the on the Scottish question, uh, it, it was clear that uh, were the Scots to favour independence in 2014, it would have taken Scotland out of the European Union. So a vote for Scottish independence in 2014 was a vote to leave the EU. It was inevitable. If, if Scotland had become an independent country... And then an attempt to rejoin. Country, that was the plan, right? But you, you, but in it, well, that yes, but that's, 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 you know, that's jam tomorrow. That's something that might happen. You know, there's plenty of evidence up front because of, the, because of Catalonia and the Basques in, in Spain and France that, that you know, that the idea of allowing a separatist country back into the European Union as far as a country like Spain was concerned, might have been a red rag to a bull. But anyway, that. But the point was, the, the Scottish National Party, the, the independence campaign, was was predicated upon, if, if you vote for independence, you're voting to leave the European Union. That's what would have happened. Yeah, at some point down the line, they, they may or may not have been able to rejoin the EU, but it was a... And at the time, they were saying, well, if that's it, that that's the way it has to be. So... It was effectively a, you know, a skexit. It was, a, it was Scotland leaving the European Union in 2014. That's what would have happened if Scotland had voted for independence. And then 2016, of course, the, the, the Brexit referendum in the UK, you know, the, the decision was taken to, to leave the European Union. And at that point, at that point only, did the, you know, did the, the, did the yes campaign or the, or, the, or the Scottish government, you know, take up the cudgels based on the fact that Scotland was being, quotes, ripped out of the European Union against its will. Well, the Scottish government would have ripped Scotland out of the European Union against its will if they had got independence in 2014. So that was a, that was a pretty fast turnaround through 180, deg 180 degrees. And I think as much as anything else, it was political expediency, uh, you know, when they, when, they, when they took up the cudgels, you know, in that, for that reason and in, and in that way. But I, you're right. I mean, when you, you said that about the, the country being divided, that, I, I think referenda are, a, are a, 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 my instinct is against. I think when you, when you give people binary decisions to make, you, you better have a very good reason for doing that. You know, there are, there are questions. You know, do you turn around to your wife after 20 years and say, do you really love me? You th I mean, what, why would you... <laughs> Why do you ask the question? It's not going to. It's probably. It, it's probably going to cause problems asking a question like that. And the, the the Brexit question, the Scottish independence question, it was guaranteed to cause nothing but hurt, and so it has done. Hey Francis, do you like Martians? Well, I work with one, don't I? Would you like to have an immersive experience with a Martian? Are you going to get me drunk on the vodka? In my like last time. You wish. No, there's this great new immersive experience in London based on Jeff Wayne's The War of the Worlds. I've heard about this. The audience reviews have been incredible. It was rated one of the top 20 things to do in London at night and 98% of guests recommend it. The experience features a cast of 17 characters, 12 live actors, plus a mix of holograms, projections, and VR of West End stars. You feel all your senses fired as you crawl, slide, and weave your way through 22,000 feet of immersive action 
including 24 extraordinary scenes and having to escape 300 foot Martian machines and the evacuation of London. It is fully compliant with COVID regulations and they're offering up to 10 pounds off standard weekday tickets with our promo code, which is of course, Trigger. All you need to do to take advantage of this fantastic offer is go to the War of the Worlds Immersive.com. That's the War of the Worlds Immersive.com and experience a world where we're being invaded by Martians, which is still better than being in lockdown. Follow the link in the description and I'll see you there. Neil, you're a historian, and I, I actually it just occurred to me that that would be a really interesting thing to talk about. And I know you're you're very passionate about uh, Scotland remaining in, in within as part of the UK. But give us a historian, sort of neutral observer from a vantage point, the argument historically about Scotland being with England or not being like what what is the history of Scottish and English? Uh, you know, coexistence, if you like. Oh my goodness! And let me—I mean, before anybody else says it, you know, I'm not—I am not a historian. I'm an archaeologist, and I love mm, history. Sure. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, I've spent twenty years, thirty years, you know, being fascinated by history. So I speak from that. I'm a, I'm an enthusiast. I've got an enthusiast's perspective rather than a, I'm not an academic historian. I'll make that I'll make that quite clear myself. Um. <laughs> There's been something like a Scotland for a thousand years. There's been an entity understanding itself, actually, first of all, as ALBA, which is hence the, you know, Alex Salmon's breakaway independence party that he has now um, set up in competition to the, to the Scottish National Party. But for, for over a thousand years, there's been a, a geographical entity understanding itself as a place, Scotland. And likewise for England. So in the European context, these are very old countries, which sounds like a funny thing to say in a way. You think all countries are probably the same age, but they're not. You know, there's only been Germany as we as we know it today since about 1870, 1871, when it was unified in the in the form that we recognise. Likewise, Italy. Italy is about the same age, and, and other European countries are, are the same age or younger still. But so the, there's a great depth of history for both uh for both Scotland and for England. Uh and they and they they, they coexisted, you know, happily and unhappily. For, for even longer than that, uh, ever since the time of the of the Norman Conquest in 1066, which was you know was, was effectively a kind of a French takeover at the boardroom level of the United Kingdom, uh, and and thereafter that that French Norman French presence began to have an effect not only in England but but in Scotland as well, you know Robert Bruce, you know the iconic legend of, of Scottish history and Scottish independence is Robert de Bruce. You know, he's, he's descended and not that far away from, you know, not, not too many generations away from, from Norman French. Uh, and, and by the time Robert Bruce was in play, there, there had been many Scottish monarchs who had imported uh, Norman French into, you know, into Scotland to, to, to be their allies. And, and in many ways, the wars of independence that ensued between Scotland and England were... Were a, were a, it was a fight between rival French families to some extent. You know, Edward I, uh, Robert Bruce, there, there was much more going on than, than anything that was just straightforwardly traditionally you know, Scottish in inverted commas or English in inverted commas. And the, you know, they, they were brought, they, they came closer in terms of uh, marriage over, over the years uh, in, the, uh, in the 16th century, uh, Margaret, Tudor, who was Henry VIII's sister, married King James IV of Scotland. Uh, so the, the the English rose and the Scottish thistle were in, were entwined at that point in the in the early fifteen hundreds. Uh, then in fifteen thirteen there was a catastrophic disaster for a Scottish army that invaded England, a catastrophic Scottish defeat, uh, and and it, it so hollowed and and damaged the confidence of Scotland that that given that they were already bound by marriage, it, it nudged Scotland further down the road towards union. When Elizabeth died without an heir, uh, you know, when her long reign came to an end, uh, she was succeeded by James the Sixth of Scotland, who became James the First of England, and so that that brought the the two crowns together for the first time. And then in the late seventeenth century, Scotland had a, got into a disastrous overseas expedition to Darien in the Panama, uh, the Narrows of Panama in South America, lost a quarter of its wealth, just, you know, lost all in one go. It was a catastrophic economic disaster. 
And in the aftermath of that, Scots, uh, who had lost out hugely in that debacle of an attempt to set up Scottish colonies in South America, were, were coaxed into supporting the dissolution of the Scottish Parliament and joining together with the English Parliament in 1707 to create the Union of Parliaments. So at, at that point on, uh, uh, Scotland and England were not just joined by a monarch, but they were joined by a, a combined Parliament. So it's, it's been a, it, so it's been a story spanning centuries. And then the, the three centuries that have, that have elapsed since that Union in 1707 saw Scots come to prominence. Scots were very active participants in the in what became the British Empire. They were, you know, they were in, enthusiastic partners in everything that the British Empire did. And so, more recent attempts by Scots, some Scots, to distance themselves from the British flag, from the Union Jack, and from slavery and colonialism and some and and other aspects of British history that have been painted very darkly in recent times, you know, is disingenuous in the extreme because Scotland was always intimately involved in all of that. It was an enthusiastic and uh, committed partner in all of it. Uh, and then you come down you come down to the more recent more recent period, more you know, the political the political past. When I was growing up, when I was in my oh, where are we now? I mean I suppose in my, my teens, twenties and thirties Traditionally, Scotland was a country that was dominated by labour. You know, Scottish Scottish labour was you know bestrode Scotland like a colossus, and it was it was always hugely significant in terms of UK elections. The fact that, that, that labour was always able to depend upon this Scottish bloc vote for for labour, you know, it, was, it made it made the Scottish labour very influential in that in that regard. And when devolution came around in the late nineteen nineties, the Labour Party were confident that that devolution would would entrench their position. The Scottish, under Donald Dewar and the rest, they saw no reason to believe that, that Labour's dominance of Scotland would ever change. But the, the version of proportional represent, representation that they set in place, the devolution settlement, the Scotland Act, was fatally flawed. And those flaws have been exposed in more recent times. Uh, and the way in which uh, the, you know, the SNP has been able to establish a, a, a majority of itself in the Scottish Parliament is a product of the faults that were there in the, in the Scotland Act and in the devolution settlement and in the choice of proportional representation that was made at that time. So, sorry to bore you rigid with that. You, you're not. <laughs> with that, actually, with that history uh, lesson. But Francis, it's, let me just finish this. It's been, a long, it's been a long dance. It has been a long and complicated dance you know, good times and bad times, all the rest of it. And then, you know, finally, with, uh, you know, by 2014, you know, uh, Scotland or, or some Scots sought divorce from its partner of 300 years. Mm. And now you're up uh, to date. Neil, let me follow follow up a little bit on that because I lived in Scotland from about 2000 until about 2008, 2009, something like that. And so I, I saw the SNP just starting to make its first big waves. And one of the things, look, it's not my fight. It's not for me to decide the future of Scotland even when I lived there. But what I did notice was a sort of strange thing where... Uh, and, I, I, and I don't, as I say, I don't have a particular position actually on the independence question. It's not something I know, I know really enough about. But what I did definitely see was this was a time when Tony Blair, who had strong Scottish links, was prime minister. Gordon Brown was a Scottish chancellor of the Exchequer. John Reid was a Scottish Home Secretary. Many of the great offices of state in the, in the United Kingdom were filled by Scots. And, and when one Scot went, he'd often be replaced with another Scot. And yet, at the same time, I saw this sort of narrative about how Scottish people are underrepresented, not being given enough influence or power, that Scotland is being ignored down south. Like, have you noticed that as well, or did I just make that up? No, that was always that's. I mean, I grew up. I grew up through through all of that in Scotland. It was it was always. Um, it was always the case that was being made, you know, through the through the Thatcher era and more recently that. Um, the, the the allegation was always made that that Scotland would vote one way and and too much of the rest of the UK would vote for for a conservative government and so you know so having voted Labour you know Scots would would end up with a with a conservative government or or, or indeed you know even under you know SNP uh, holding sway in the Scottish government there's still a you know been a, for a long time there's been a conservative government in Westminster but. I mean, at a personal at a personal level, I can tell you that I have never lived a single day in Scotland under a government that I voted for, and I'm 54. 
I've never, <laughs> not one, not one day, not one day have I lived under a government that I've actually voted for. So I know, for, for you know, for different reasons than maybe the, that, you know, that sort of mainstream, but I know exactly what it feels like to, to, to go to the, you know, to go to the polling booth every four or five years and, uh, and walk away disappointed. I know what that is like, but yes, that's always been the case. You know, Scotland, Scotland has a different uh, political heritage. It's got, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a different, a, you know, there's, there's different aspects of character for a lot of Scots. I mean, that is, that is the case. And, and the, and the, the devolution settlement was supposed to create a situation where whatever parliament was in Holyrood, there wouldn't ever be an absolute majority the, the, the proportional representation system that we put in place was supposed to mitigate against that so that so that the whatever assembly came together in, in Holyrood would always proportionally represent the many different facets of uh you know of Scottish political life. But that is not that is not what it actually delivered as has been made plain by the by the by the way in which you know uh, uh, you know, nationalism is coming increasingly to dominate every aspect of Scottish life. And Scottish nationalism has always been a, a minority pursuit in Scotland. And when I was growing up, you know, the SNP was very much a fringe organisation. It was almost a protest group. Uh, it's so small and inconsequential did it tend to be in the scheme of things. But the, the devolution settlement in uh, the, the, uh, the, that created the, the Holyrood Assembly uh, had had cracks and fissures within it, and the and the SNP have 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 risen up through those cracks, like you know, like 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 hot water coming up in thermal springs, and it's come out on the surface, and and here we are with a you know with a Scotland that is dominated disproportionately uh, by the by the Scottish National Party. And Neil, you were talking about the slow dance. Don't you think that Scotland? It's inevitable that you're going to do a slow dance to uh, an exit from the union. I don't believe and, in know, inevitable. I don't believe okay. in inevitable. That's the Kobayashi Maru in Star Trek. I don't I don't believe in the unwinnable situation. Um yeah. and I, th I think anybody that, that that looks ahead with a crystal ball is insane. Uh, I don't believe the a polling how po how anyone can still be a pollster. I I, <laughs> I, I do not know. Uh, you know, because I mean, I worked in I worked in, in newspapers and I've been around polling and you know, the first thing a polling company asks you when you approach them for a poll is what answer do you want you, you know what do you want this poll to tell you and they'll just go away and they'll and they'll and they'll give you that result so all the polling that's out there now around everything that was around brexit that's around support for lockdowns that's around support for vaccine passports and all the rest of it all of it on a on account of polling and depending on what you're looking at you'll see that oh yeah there's been a swing to a vote for an, an increased support for for independence or separatism in Scotland. I don't buy it. I talk to people. I can only really, like everyone else, I can only honestly uh, reflect back the 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 opinions that I hear. Now I'm quite I'm quite recognisable in Scotland and you know where I live. And a lot of people come up to me and talk to me. People from all sorts of walks of life, all ages, both sexes, all through the classes. People come up to me and and, and air their views. And my straw poll tells me that there is still, to this day, a majority in favour of remaining in the United Kingdom in Scotland. Now, that's, I, I can, I'm honestly, hand on heart, I am reflecting to you what I understand to be the mood of the people in Scotland. And regardless of what's said about, you know, wh who's going to hold majorities here, there and everywhere, that's, that's down to the, that's down to the, to the inadequacies of the, of the devolution settlement. I, as I understand it myself, based on the people that, that come up and talk to me, there's a majority in favour of remaining in the United Kingdom and Scotland. So in answer to your question, no, nothing's inevitable. I don't believe in the Kobayashi Maru. Well, that told me, Neil. Thank you very much. <laughs> but there are things that are happening in Scotland that just leave me open mouthed. The hate speech bill. The, yeah, is, is it Hamza Youssef who has brought in this hate speech bill? Well, and forgive me, I may have got this wrong, but from what I understood from the bill, it, you can get arrested for things that you say in the privacy of your own home if it gets reported to the police. Well, if it it's still in the process. So the, the hate crime uh, bill has gone through a consultation process. It's been approved by a vote in... In, in the Scottish Parliament, but it's yet to get what is it the royal assent. So it's not it's not the law of the land yet. But yes, 
uh, hypothetically, uh, if I was to say something in my house, that, you know, sitting at the sitting on the couch with my wife and kids, I could say something, and one of my kids could repeat it outside in the playground at school. Well, if they ever go to school again, uh, <laughs> and it, depending on who overheard what one of my children said, I had said hypothetically, I could go to jail for seven years for something that I said while sitting on the couch watching telly in the privacy of my own home. The the hate crime bill has been extremely controversial. I I don't, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, I've never been a political person. I've never joined a political party. I hold politicians in, in, in general contempt, really. I'm cynical to the point where it almost chokes me when, that, when I have to make a decision about who to vote for every general election. Like Billy Connolly, I believe that the spoken desire to be a politician should bar you for life from ever being allowed to be one. That said, I've I've, be, I've drifted into to paying more and more attention to things political as the years have gone on. I only became aware of the hate crime bill in truth because I realised that so many unlikely bedfellows were getting together to say this is a disaster waiting to happen. You know, it was figures from the church, it was the police, it was people from the legal fraternity, uh, it was uh, the, uh, authors, comedians, p uh, politicians, all sorts of people were coming together. You know, this, this unlikely confederacy formed when it was in the consultation period, saying, You're going, there's holes in this, this legislation is so sloppy, so loose, so open to, to dangerous misinterpretation, it's a disaster waiting to happen. It, it, there's it, a lot of the disquiet rotates around the notion of stirring up hatred. That's that's the language that's involved. If you if you say something or do something, and someone who hears you say it believes in their heart that you were stirring up hatred, then potentially you're in trouble, and the onus would be on you to prove that you had not intended to stir up that hatred, and. I, it might have passed me by, but so many different groups, people that you would never have expected to hear speaking together on the same subject, were saying, you can't have that. The, the, the notion that you might stir up hatred, it's, it's so vague you could drive a coach and horses through the gaps in it. Tighten that up or take it out altogether. And so I thought, oh, goodness me, there, there truly must be something questionable about this. And... Uh, you know, there's been various amendments made and things taken out, but in the form that it went through for approval by uh, the Scottish Parliament, which it got, everyone voted for it, with the exception of the Conservative MSPs, SNP, Labour, Lib Dem and Green, they all nodded it through. It was shameful that they voted through this flawed, dangerously untidy, sloppy legislation. Uh, and we'll see, what, we'll see what becomes of it in the years ahead. But yes... You know, hypothetically, the, the the danger that it poses to freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, is is alive and well in Scotland, and we're all worried sick about it. Hey, KK, do you like feeling silky and smooth like a sexual dolphin? Never talk to me again. What if I told you that Manscaped have brought out a new and improved lawnmower 3.0? that allows you to be fresh and trim for the ladies down below. Mate, I've been married 20 years. The last time I was fresh and trim down below, Jimmy Savile was a respected children's entertainer. I'm gonna ignore that. The lawn mower has a cutting edge ceramic blade, which reduces the risk of having an accident where you least want an accident. My bank account. No, you idiot, you know, Los Huevos. Oh, right. Plus, it's waterproof which means you can groom in the shower and it has an LED light, so you can get a really accurate and precise trim. Excellent. To take advantage of this incredible offer, go to manscaped.com and you'll get 20% off with free shipping. Just use our code, which is of course, Trigger. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use our code, Trigger. Your huevos will thank you. Excellent. Neil, I've gigged many times in Scotland. I've gigged in the Stand in Glasgow many times. I'm going to be honest with you, it's my favourite comedy club in the UK. Brilliant. The crowds are amazing. You know, you're much freer than you would be in shishi liberal London where everybody takes offence and grabs their handbag, you know, because you start to go into, you know, choppier waters. How can it be that a land like that where 
There's a love of jokes, there's a love of banter that has produced incredible comedians, transgressive comedians. People associate Billy Connolly now as being this cute, cuddly comedian. He wasn't in his pomp. Jerry Sadowitz, why have you suddenly gone down this route? Well, that is the question that everyone on my side of the debate wants answered. It was always, I mean, there were so many reasons. I mean, when I, when I would... When I would go a, 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 on holiday in my teens, you know, when I was a student and, and, and shortly thereafter, and I'd be whatever, I'd be in the Greek islands or I'd be in Spain or whatever. It was always, it was always a joy to be identified as somebody from Scotland because it, it, as soon as people realised, people from all over, all over Europe, they associated, you're from Scotland and they, they expected you to be funny and they expected that right off the top they could uh, you know they could uh, they could um, take the pee out of you, and you know they could have they would expect to be able to have great fun with you. That you wouldn't take offence. That you were up for a laugh. It was all it was, and we were we were regarded as being sort of free thinking, open, uh, you know, liberal, tolerant people. And it was it was a joy. It was a joy to be associated with that. And I have lived to see Scotland go through this metamorphosis, where now there's this puritanism has come through. There was always puritan aspects to Scotland. You know. Scotland was one of the few countries in Europe that took Calvinism to its breast, you know, while other countries in Europe were saying, you know, over my dead body. There's there's always been that element in that joylessness. It's, it's part of the gaiety of the nation. It's part of the rich tapestry that is Scotland. But there were always these small-minded, Calvinist, joyless, you know, just, you know, go home and live in your miserable wee house and drink a cup of tea and and watch a soap opera on the telly and that's good enough for you. There was always that element, but it was drowned out by the by the broader picture of Scots who were you know who were ready for a joke ready for a laugh didn't take things too seriously you know were passionate about a discussion passionate politically it enjoyed nothing more than having a right good square go of a debate in a pub or over a dinner table or whatever and then would just move on from it and then five days later have the same fight again and <laughs> you know and, and 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 just go through it all again and now with the with the hate crime bill and other legislation, there is just this sense of 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 the Scottish government of the Scottish National Party wanting to put a lid on what has always been Scotland. Shut the door, draw the curtains, keep yourself to yourself, be secretive. You know, there's just this um, claustrophobic, joyless atmosphere that has that has established itself like damp in Scotland. Uh, and it's dispiriting in the extreme. And yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, for no, it was no surprise that, say, the, the the Edinburgh Fringe, you know, was regarded around the world as as somewhere that you would come to to see or to listen to the best fun comedy on the planet. And now, a, a, a situation has been created where somebody's saying something that could be construed as stirring up hatred. And God knows. I mean, how many how many different ways could you interpret a statement like that? Could see a could see a comedian end up in jail. That's why I've been encouraging him to go back to Scotland so I can have the podcast to myself. Well, you, you joke, but actually, Neil, you know, uh, the last time we were able to do Edinburgh as comedians was 2019. I took my show to Edinburgh, and as part of the show, I made a number of you know, it was a show about the importance of freedom of expression, and so I deliberately went out of my way to show that certain very offensive words can be uttered in, in a particular context. And I would have jokes to, to, to support that and to take the, the, the audience on a journey from, well, I'm not sure freedom of speech is important, all the way to, well, here's some examples and here's how you go with it. But in order to do that, I had to bring up very offensive things and to talk about them comedically. Now, I'll be honest with you, if I was doing that show now, I would not come back to the Edinburgh Fringe. Well, no, you'd, well, it, 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 we're yet to see. We're yet to see. As I say, the, the, as I understand, the hate, the hate crime bill is not there yet. But that was one of the loudest groups that spoke out in consternation and alarm when this thing was going through its consultation period. It, were comedians? That was that, that was one of the things that was grabbing headlines the length and breadth of of the UK. Were comedians saying, "I'll never be able to go back to Edinburgh. I can't go and do. I can't go and do a, you know, such and such." A show because I could end up in jail, and, and, and it'd even be it wouldn't you wouldn't even have to say it in in uh, in Scotland. I mean, I've you know I've been doing stuff on, you know I've been doing stuff on you know I just uh, I talk to talk radio on a on a weekly basis, 
you know, that, that gets broadcast nationally and, and you know, m hypothetically Mike Graham or, or another of the another of the DJs could, could find themselves accused of stirring up hatred in Scotland, although they're taking part in a broadcast from London. The, 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 the sloppy nature of the legislation that has gone through frightens everyone to death. And for someone, you know, like me, I mean, I, I, I revel, although I've never been political, I revel in arguing. I love arguing with people. I, I, and I love, you know, I, I would take up a position on a on a topic just so that I could have a fight about it. I don't mean fisticuffs. I just mean a verbal exchange, mm. because right. that, that's in it's in my nature to do that and to you know and to express opinions. And I, and I, I love being I love being in the cut and thrust of all that, you know, heated debate, and, and all the rest of it. And and that 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 the opportunity to have something as simple and joyful as a heated argument about a topic about whatever gender or race or religion or all the stuff of life but you couldn't have that debate in Scotland from now on because you could open your mouth be accused of stirring up hatred and be in Berlini for seven years mm. Berlini and being Neil a prison in Glasgow <laughs> oh I'm, I'm well familiar with it uh, <laughs> no but uh, Neil I it's it's an interesting moment we're in because I feel like Scotland, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like Scotland is not really an exception on this front. You you have some stuff going on that maybe we don't quite yet, but broadly, we seem to be in a very particular moment in history where we are repeating a lot of the mistakes that have been repeated at these peak moments of madness in the past. What What... How do you look at it from an, you know, obviously an archaeologist, but an, an enthusiast of history? Like, what is the moment we're in? What what are some of the parallels? What should we be wary of as societies in the current climate? I think, well, it it, it can only be a it can only be cumulative, can't it? It, it must be a it must be a cocktail of, of many elements. I think, in no small part, it, it, it has to do with the fact that. You know, broadly, since broadly speaking, since the end of the Second World War, the people of Western Europe and certainly this archipelago have broadly lived in peace. You know, and and that and that that threat has been has has been something that happened elsewhere, and 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 I suspect with that comes a dangerous complacency, and and we've we've lived with and we've enjoyed freedoms that are that are unique not just in the world but unique in history as as many people have said you know life has been almost intolerable for 99% of the human species for 99% of the time uh, and what 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 evolved very very recently in our part of the world was unique uh, and so vulnerable uh, and if if too many i suppose if too many generations go by without the, the necessity to defend and, and, and be aware of the uniqueness of our position, I suppose it, 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 it's too easy to grow up thinking that that which is here now will always be here. Mm. As though tolerance and freedom and the, and the ability to travel around and do what you like and say what you like and travel internationally um, and, uh, and, and take all advantage of all of those freedoms... You, th you might think that they're natural, but they're not. Nothing about the way that we've lived in our part of the world for 100 years has been natural. It's extremely unnatural. It's blessed and, and been wonderful, but it's an incredibly fragile flower. And it's only when that, when that, when that beautiful thing is snatched away from people that they realise that the snatching away is even possible. I don't think it occurs to people. You know, we live, we live in something that is held aloft by... By by centuries of of hard won struggle, you know we're in a penthouse flat with a fantastic view, and the the ossified desiccated bones that are holding us up are are made and shaped by the suffering of generation after generation, and it, it's a it's been a, a story of triumph and disaster, but it's left us held up somewhere in the sky, and if you knock out. If you knock out those layers below us, that tower that's been holding us up, we will not remain suspended in midair. You know, our 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 lovely penthouse with its fantastic views of the world will just topple 
it'll just drop straight to the ground. And uh, there's maybe we're two, three generations into soft living. Uh, maybe all. I mean, I I I caught the the end of of that of those generations that were let loose. As a kid, I was just sent out of the house in the morning and and came back in at night or when I got hungry. Um, but 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 the generations since, and I, and I've seen it with my own children, wrapped in cotton wool, you know, looked after, I, 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 you know, as though they were fine bone china that was going to be, you know, terribly damaged if anybody handled it roughly, and and I think those generations, maybe a couple of generations, have come up risk averse, um, and and feeling threat everywhere, and that the advent of something like this, you know, pandemic. Uh, has just been the has just been something that has that has terrified people and made people think that maybe the world isn't a perfect place, and in seeking safety from it, they've been prepared to surrender. We are too many people have been prepared to surrender well all of their freedom, in order to feel safe from a virus that's ninety nine point seven percent survivable anyway, and look how quickly look how quickly society changes. You know, you might have thought five years ago, you might have said that changes like we've gone through in the last 12 months would take a generation. Now, you do it in a weekend if you're busy enough. And here we are. I mean, here we are in, indeed, Neil. And I suppose the question is, how do we row back from this? Because it seems we're, at, we're hitting crisis point in Scotland, in England, all over the world. Do you think there might be a natural backlash against everything that's happening, Neil? Just a younger generation of people coming through who are like, well, we've been brought up with safety. We need to rebel against it. We want freedom again. Uh, and, and we've got a generation maybe of younger people. This is just me talking optimistically now, mm. which is unusual for me. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, talking, uh, thinking about, well, we've got an opportunity now to be different. We want to rebel against our parents. We want freedom. We want to be able to say what we think. Uh, we want to be able to do what we want to do. Well, I think you're right. I think it's an obligation to be optimistic. Uh, almost. I mean, I, I'm as depressive as the next, as the next Celtic Scot. You know, I've got. I tend towards the dark side all the time, uh, and my and my wife says to me all the time, you know, you know, lighten up for God's sake, <laughs> <laughs> because I I tend I tend to the darkness, and 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 I I do feel that it's it's almost an obligation to 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 hope for the best. And I would like to think, you know, I've got I've got kids, uh, 17, 15 and 12. And, you know, we talk to them and I know that they have unconsciously absorbed the the uh, the appreciation of the of the freedoms that we've had. You know, we've had the kids traveling a bit and, they you know, they go to school and they do the normal things. You know, they've lived in a you know, they've lived in a free society where they were able to, you know, roam around and go to the cinema and go out to eat and see their friends and stay in each other's houses and all the rest of it. Uh, and they've seen that they've seen that taken away, and they balk at it. I see them bridle at it, and they tell us that their friends, their their peers, their contemporaries are are saying the same. And and so that you hope, you hope, you absolutely hope that some of that appetite for freedom is, has become genetic or epigenetic, and that it, and it, it's there in people's DNA. And and ultimately, everything's always about the people. It's it's so simplistic and cliched to say it, but the. Those making decisions and those those who seek to rule over us are a are a microscopic minority. And you've got you know in every country you've got tens of millions of people, uh, and if and if tens of millions of people are dissatisfied, and exercise their uh, right to 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 live freely, uh, then you know then that that will prevail. You know that that you know. Freedoms have been taken from people wholesale before, but but the desire for freedom is like is like grass through tarmac. It, it just comes back, and and it takes so much energy for authoritarian and totalitarian regimes to keep the pressure on that inevitably they always become exhausted. It takes too much effort. I mean, we all know that you know if you're going to have a police state, you end up in a situation where you need one policeman for every person at least. Uh, and it becomes too exhausting, and it's it's easier it's easier to be free, uh, and and I hope I hope that 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 people you know realize it, it's all about re looking at what we've had and knowing that it it's as fragile as a spring flower, you know uh, uh, a, a moment you know uh, as as Robert Burns said you know like the snow falls in the river, a moment white then melts forever, 
you know, it's these these freedoms that we have had are 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 fragile and ethereal. You seize the flower, its bloom is dead. You know, if 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 enough people waken up to the fact that you know freedoms are 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 fragile, uh, rare, and and to and to be cherished, and and yes, the obligation is to be optimistic, and and the obligation is to hope that uh, that, that enough people demand. Uh, the freedom that they have known. Neil, thank you so much for that. It has been an absolutely brilliant interview. Flew by. Um, we always finish our interviews with the same question, which is, what is the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? The truth. I keep hearing, I keep hearing, m most recently on that royal interview, uh, about people talking about my truth, your truth. There's only the truth, and enough everything, everything, the kind of society that I want and the kind of society that, that I know that the majority of the people that I know and love want is predicated upon everyone having the confidence and indeed taking the responsibility, accepting the obligation to tell the truth. Don't just think it, don't just know it, but every opportunity you get in a public forum, tell the truth. It's like Mark Twain said, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolutely brilliant episode, as it always is with you. If you want to find Neil on Twitter, go to The Coast Guy and you'll be able to find him there. You can also check him out on Patreon. If you can spare a little dough, make sure you do, because Neil's work is absolutely brilliant. And he has a brilliant podcast out as well. He's one of the best people at talking about history. So make sure you check that out. Thank you for watching, and we will see you very soon with another brilliant episode like this one or a live stream. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Take care, and remember they go out always 7 o'clock UK time. See you soon, guys. We hope you've enjoyed this incredible interview. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you never miss another fantastic episode. And if you believe that the work we do here at Trigonometry is important, support us by joining our locals community using the link below.